Good evening, I'm Mike Canetter, and welcome to the UW Now live stream series, where we bring you experts from our UW community talking about timely and important topics. Yesterday marked two years since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in Dane County. And as the second year of the pandemic draws to a close, many of us wonder how much more is left. The rise of the Omicron variant brings a feeling of deja vu for many of us. What do we know about COVID-19 now that we didn't know in 2020? And how does that affect the way we fight the virus and its variants going forward? What are the keys to, to bringing the pandemic into an endemic stage? And how have the discoveries of the past two years changed the way we look at pandemics? And what do they suggest about our future? Joining us tonight are two of UW's top COVID experts, Dr. Nasia Safdar, from UW Hospitals and Clinics and the School of Medicine and Public Health in the Department of Medicine, and Dr. Ajay Sethi from the School of Medicine and Public Health's Department of Population Health Sciences. You are among our most frequent guests on the show for obvious reasons. Your expertise is uh, more valuable than ever to all of us, and I really appreciate you both taking the time to be here again with our audience tonight. Our first guest tonight will be Dr. Safdar. She's a faculty member in the Division of Infectious Disease, formerly Medical Director of Infection Control at UW Hospitals and Clinics, and the Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine. She leads the mission to reduce healthcare-associated infections by identifying, testing, and implementing novel interventions. Her many awards include the President's Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and the John Q. Sherman Award for Excellence in Patient Engagement. She was recently named the School of Medicine and Public Health's inaugural Associate Dean for Clinical Trials. Dr. Safdar received her PhD in Clinical Research and her MS in Population Health Sciences right here at UW-Madison. Dr. Safdar, it is always a pleasure to have you back uh, in December, you were here to warn us about the rise of the Omicron variant. Uh, please tell us, where are we now? And uh, could you hazard a guess at what lies ahead? Sounds great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about COVID today. We'll start with the slides. If you could go to the next slide. So there's, of course, a lot of things that one could talk about. There's no shortage of topics, that's for sure. But I thought I would focus today on three things. You know, one is the effect of COVID on the health systems. The other is some new treatment options that have um, fortunately become available. And the third is what I think will be this next phase is something we'll really have to focus on, which is long COVID or the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. So the effect of COVID on health systems, I think there are the apparent things that we can see, and then there are the inapparent and the um, occult things that I think will become um, more known over time and will probably take several years to recover from. So these are the obvious things. I think we can all recognize pretty easily that there have been major disruptions in care. And even though those disruptions in care have been lessened somewhat by the fact that we now have a great deal of knowledge about COVID and how to handle it in health systems, it doesn't take away from the fact that the health system is not necessarily equipped to handle a pandemic on top of a typically already full to bursting capacity. Uh, we have also learned that staffing crises are not something that are going to go away in a hurry and need a more holistic approach um, rather than a band-aid type of uh, approach. I think the supply chain vulnerabilities have become clear to people. PPE is one of them, but there have also been issues with testing. There have been issues with data systems, you know, everything that you can think of that you would need to manage a pandemic, we found that we had vulnerabilities in. And ultimately, in some places, that has led to trade-offs in the way that care is delivered. For instance, there were several states that, you know, we remember that early on in the days of the pandemic when, when some health systems had to implement crisis standards of care, which essentially means that you are focused really on COVID and may have to turn away individuals with non-COVID related medical conditions that you don't have the capacity to care for. Now, we hope that it wouldn't come to that point again, but again, um, earlier this year and late last year, we saw that some health systems had to, had to do that in some states. Next slide. And so there are now starting to come out studies that are talking about what are the changes in non-COVID-19 uh, ED visits. 
And the hypothesis here is that we remember that during the lockdown phase uh, early in 2020, um, people stopped coming to emergency departments and only came to seek health care if it was something that couldn't be reasonably delayed. And of course, the downside to that is that people may wait too long to seek medical care. And what that means for the health system is that you might see somewhat fewer patients, but what you're seeing then is people with high acuity medical conditions that have a high rate of complications and, um, and death for that medical condition. And so this was one study. This was from Barnes Jewish. They had 13 emergency departments. Um, several million patients that they looked at here. And they found that people did in fact delay care uh, throughout this pandemic. And when they came to the emergency department, it was for, you know, in their view, unavoidable reasons, but care should have been accessed earlier. I think this is particularly true for acute conditions like heart attacks and strokes, and for more chronic things like cancer, where the effect of these delays are not going to be known immediately, but probably will come to light um, as this uh, pandemic evolves. If you go to the next slide. Fortunately, though, there have been some advances um, in the form of new treatment options available. And the reason that I'm bringing this up here is that, you know, in the earlier phases of the pandemic, we focused mainly on individuals who were very sick, who needed ICU care, who needed hospital care, because that was the urgent need at that time was to, was to save lives. And so a lot of treatment trials focused on that population. Now, as we evolve into this next phase, our focus is going to be, you know, besides the obvious vaccinations and boosters, it's going to be on people that get COVID while they're at home or in the community, but are at high risk of complications and you know, the need for medical care arising from there. So, of course, the best prevention is the most upstream, but short of that, because we know that given the case counts that are circulating around us, many people will end up getting exposed to COVID and will get the illness. What can you do if you get it? to prevent it from progressing. So the first part of this slide is the most important thing, which is an individual that has COVID, but doesn't require hospitalization, doesn't need supplemental oxygen, is doing reasonably okay. But in those individuals, there's a high risk for complications if you're immunocompromised, if you're on the older end of the age spectrum, if you have comorbidities that would make you less able to cope with severe COVID should you get it, like heart and lung disease and cancer and so on. And so for those individuals, there's now two treatment options that are available. One is molnupiravir and the other is Paxlovid that you may have heard about in the lay press. Um, both have um, scarcities in terms of supply, but that is likely to improve. And of the two, Paxlovid is by far the better option such that the NIH guidelines say that you only use molnupiravir if the other one is not available. There is also the option of remdesivir being used as an outpatient, but it is an IV infusion, so the logistics of it can be very challenging. And of course, we all heard a great deal about monoclonal antibodies in the earlier phases of this pandemic, but with Omicron, the only one that works is this one that's listed here, so Trivimab, which again had some supply issues and those are likely to go up and down, but it just goes to show you that, you know, when we think we found the answer, the virus found, so finds a way to outwit us yet again. The lower part of this slide is mainly for individuals who are discharged from hospital settings and uh, and hasn't changed all that much, but I wanted to bring to attention the, uh, the first part, which is really the main changes. Next slide. So in the event that there are shortages, which we've already seen with these therapeutics, what are the ways that we should prioritize the use of these direct antiretrovirals and the monoclonal antibody? I think our first priority should be individuals who are immunocompromised. And I use the term immunocompromised pretty loosely. I mean, the CDC and the NIH have a long list of conditions that compromise your immune system, um, and we should use that as a starting point. But anyone who has you know, uncontrolled chronic conditions like asthma, for instance, not traditionally immune compromising, but certainly at high risk of complications. So having said that, if we go back to the immunocompromised, People who are not expected to mount um, an adequate immune response because their own immune system is not capable of doing so. So regardless of their vaccine status, they should be prioritized for these um, direct antivirals. And then as you go on further down the list, there's some other prioritization. Now, hopefully, you know, it wouldn't come to that, but, but we have seen that, uh, that the supply does go up and down. Next slide. Transmission of Omicron, I think, has been particularly um, interesting from the virus um, ecology standpoint and worrisome from the standpoint of the fact that it is very easy to transmit this particular variant and the uh, 
the subvariant that we're starting to see news about is likely to behave similarly. So I wanted to highlight one particular study that was a mathematical modeling approach to figuring out how can we best prevent transmission of Omicron when it comes to masking. So if you go to the next slide, this is a complicated figure. There's a lot of caveats to it because this was this is a modeling study. It's not real world conditions, but they looked at exposure for 20 minutes between an individual who is I, meaning infected, and S, meaning susceptible. And the various um, masks that you see here on the slide are combinations of you know both parties wearing one, both parties wearing different types of masks, and and so on. And so if you start from the left-hand part of the slide, the FF in all caps is a variant of an N95. It's, it's what Europe uses. It's considered very similar. So very well-fitting mask, and you can adjust it further by doing fit checks and seeing if it fits you really well. And they found that when both parties were wearing that, the risk of transmission was the lowest, both the infected and the susceptible. Uh, and the risk of transmission was highest when, of course, neither party was wearing a mask, but if only the susceptible individual was wearing a mask, there was still a reasonably high chance of transmission because unless you're wearing something that is really tight fitting, there will still be gaps and leakages around your mask such that if say an infected person who may have a cough, for instance, happens to cough in your vicinity, particles will escape from the sides of your mask and, and enter your nose and mouth and potentially um, uh, make you more likely to acquire um, Omicron. And so the, the small Fs here, on the x-axis of this slide are the non-adjusted um, equivalent of an N95. So meaning that it's not a particular N95 that you have been fit tested for, but one that nonetheless fits snugly. And you can see that the risk of transmission goes up a little bit higher if you have one that isn't. Now, of course, the caveats to this is that these individuals were, you know, because this is not a real world study, um, imagine someone who's coughing versus not coughing, you would think the risk of infection would be much higher. And then the duration of exposure, of course, the longer it is, the more it determines whether someone will get infected or not. But I say this to highlight the fact that if someone is immunocompromised, even if they have been vaccinated and boosted, I think that they should take these extra steps to protect themselves uh, if they find themselves in situations where they uh, think they might be exposed to Omicron. Next slide. So what the study essentially showed was, to summarize, is that they found that physical distancing alone without masking is associated with a high risk of infection. Uh, and again, not a surprise, especially in situations where an infectious individual is speaking. Um, and so, of course, physical distancing is desirable when possible, but as the world starts to engage more in activities of daily living, it seems less and less likely that physical distancing will become a, a tenable possibility. Um, and so both parties wearing a face mask is the most important thing, which is what they mean here by saying universal masking, which does seem to be effective for limiting. You know, it's, it's never 100%, but limiting or mitigating airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2, even if you have something that you haven't been really fit tested for, but is a close enough seal to the face. And the main factor in fa affecting infection risk in this universal masking where both parties are wearing masks is the leakage between the mask and the face. And this is the basis behind the CDC's recommendation to say that you really should aim for a well-fitting mask and take whatever steps you can to achieve that fit, whether it's putting a knot in the loops or getting a, a different kind of mask or, or wearing a, a nose fitter. Next slide. Next, let's move on to, to long COVID. And long COVID is one of those syndromes where we still have a great deal to learn about. The definitions between the WHO and the CDC are not the same. We'll go with the CDC definition for now, which is that after 30 days or so of the initial onset of COVID, if you either have new symptoms or persistence of symptoms, then you might fall into this category of long COVID. For a long time now, we haven't really understood the full impact of long COVID, partly because not enough time had elapsed. But this study from The Lancet did an online survey of several thousand individuals. So if you go to the next slide, they attempted to understand not just the symptoms of long COVID, but also the impact that it had. And their main goal was you know, to figure out what's going to happen to society when long COVID really takes hold. Um, it's probably the tip of the iceberg right now. And so from almost 4,000 participants, some of these were confirmed COVID and some of these were suspected COVID. Everyone had illness lasting over 28 days and the onset was prior to June, 2020. 
So this typically will not include people who were, for instance, vaccinated or had um, access to a lot of the therapeutics that you would expect at this point. So if you go to the next slide, what they found was that a large number of people had symptoms associated with um, either um, higher level cognitive dysfunction, so memory, fogginess. Uh, it's usually pretty vaguely defined by patients because it's hard to find the words sometimes to describe the difference. You know, these are people who are completely um, doing very well before got COVID, potentially a mild illness, but yet find themselves struggling uh, to get back to work, for instance, or to, to do the activities that they were used to. And there's no real age gap here. Uh, people of all ages suffered from the cognitive dysfunction and the the impact of that memory and cognitive dysfunction on work and the ability to return to work. Almost 50% uh, of them found that they needed adjustments in their work schedule or some kind of accommodation was necessary to enable them to go back to work. So this, I think, you know, is pretty telling uh, because it suggests that unless we plan for this and really invest a lot of efforts in trying to figure this out and fix it, uh, we're going to find ourselves with this next phase of pandemic in a pretty bad situation with long COVID. And of course, there is a lot of lines of inquiry are being followed and a lot of research funding is being poured into this. But we can't lose sight of the fact that just because it's a poorly described syndrome doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and doesn't have an impact on people. The major clusters of symptoms seem to be related around fatigue, malaise that's following exercise or exertion, sleep issues, and then the cognitive dysfunction I mentioned. So there's no specific treatment for long COVID, but vaccination does reduce the risk of contracting it. If you go to the next slide. So these are the, um, the triggers of relapses and the symptom course that people noticed. One thing about long COVID that has become apparent is that it's not that you get it and then it goes away. You might have ups and downs and you can see some of the triggers are pretty conventional ones like stress and alcohol and caffeine and so on. Um, sometimes before um, a menstruation cycle, you might expect to have um, a relapse or a trigger. All these are things that we're learning a great deal about. And of course, this is all self-reported. So there would probably be some refinement to some of these things as we get biomarkers and other diagnostic tests. I mean, at the moment, there's not even a diagnostic test for, for COVID that is objective, or for long COVID, I should say. Next slide. So the take home uh, point from this study was sort of the, for the majority of respondents, the time to recovery exceeded 35 weeks. And so at the very least, when people start to get those symptoms, they now have an anchor to say that, yes, um, it's going to take a while, it will get better, but it's not going to be immediate. Many people had multiple symptoms, suggesting that this is not really just a respiratory post-infectious sequelae, but is a multi-organ system disorder. And as I mentioned, the piece about post-exertional malaise is pretty telling people come and say, you know, they used to be able to do exercise and feel good afterwards, and now they feel the opposite. And so that's that's been a, a way for us to understand what they're experiencing. Many people experienced relapses and cognitive dysfunction or memory issues were common across all age groups. So if you go to the next slide, I just want to change gears for a second as we think about, you know, what does it mean to start to understand living with COVID uh, and people have likened it, for instance, to, well, we live with flu, and why can't we do the same with COVID? And of course, with flu, there are years that are good and years that are bad. This particular year so far, you know, has, has not been terrible for influenza. We still had a lot more cases than we had last year, where we had virtually none. But compared to the year before, so far, the caseload has been um, much lower. So if you go to the next slide, we use the CDC's flu tracker. And so just to remind people that not everything of uh, respiratory origin is COVID. There are plenty of other respiratory viruses floating around, but influenza has peaked and is on the downswing at this point. The majority of our H1 uh, were A, H3, and 2, which is uh, something that the vaccine has a reasonable match for, although fewer people this year got vaccinated for influenza than, than one would like. Next slide. So the number of hospital admissions continue to decline. The cumulative hospitalization, as I mentioned, was lower than the year before last. Uh, and nonetheless, though, the CDC estimates that there have been at least 2 million flu illnesses, 20,000 hospitalizations, and 1,200 deaths from flu so far this season. Next slide. And this is what it looks like for us. You can see that we are in the low to minimal activity at this point, uh, but several 
states around the country are experiencing high levels, which is pretty typical for influenza. Next slide. So what are the next steps for COVID mitigation? I think the fact that the vaccinations are becoming um, available imminently for younger children is a huge step in the right direction. It will be very reassuring to parents and of course will allow younger children to, to engage more in activities for their health and well-being. I think we want to encourage the widespread use of outpatient therapies, particularly for at-risk individuals, in addition to the vaccinations and boosters that are going to remain the mainstay for COVID prevention. Ajay will talk at length about endemicity, so I will stop there except to say that, you know, we've been talking about living with COVID. It doesn't mean that you start ignoring it or you stop doing mitigation. It just means that we try to ease ourselves into a place where we think the risk of daily living with COVID is, is now more acceptable than it has been in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Safdar. Uh, insightful as always, and we'll be back with questions shortly. Uh, our next guest tonight is Dr. Ajay Sethi, Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences and Faculty Director for the Master of Public Health Program at the School of Medicine and Public Health. As an infectious disease epidemiologist, he studies behavioral and structural factors associated with infectious disease transmission and morbidity. Ajay, research, his research spans uh, HIV AIDS, COVID-19, healthcare associated infections, and the microbiome. He teaches the popular course, Conspiracies in Public Health, preparing future healthcare workers for difficult conversations that they might encounter with patients. Ajay received his PhD in epidemiology and masters of health science in molecular microbiology and immunology from the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Ajay, it's great to have you back on the show. Tell us your take on where we're at and where we're going. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for inviting me back and, and I'm happy to be here. Um, can I get that first slide, please? Yeah, so these are daily trends in COVID-19 deaths in the United States. And you recall that we began vaccinations a little over a year ago. At the time, supply was limited and target groups were prioritized. But by April 19th, 2021, all adults became eligible. And as more people chose to get vaccinated, and as we moved into the summer, uh, COVID deaths reached its lowest level um, uh, during this pandemic in July 2021. And that was only six and a half months ago. Uh, and then, of course, we had the Delta wave and we reached a new peak in COVID mortality in September 2021. We then experienced some reprieve again shortly after Thanksgiving until the emergence of Omicron. And today, daily deaths are increasing as cases are receding nationally. So today, you know, the future feels perhaps more uncertain than it did a year ago. Uh, the last two waves occurred when society had its first crack at returning to normal. K through 12, college campuses, workplaces were beginning to return to in-person operations. So, you know, today it can maybe feel, uh, you know, hard. Uh, it, can, it can be hard to feel, frankly, uh, secure about the future and in a lot of ways, you know, we have less naivete today uh, than we did a year ago, and thus maybe we perceive more uncertainty about our future. We are approaching 900,000 deaths, uh, and on the right is a picture of the art installation in America, Remember, by Suzanne Brennan Furstenberg of Washington, D.C. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the first public health messages we probably all recall was flatten the curve to preserve the healthcare system capacity. And we use non-pharmaceutical interventions, staying at home, closure of schools, uh, you know, uh, and non-essential businesses and services, banning gatherings, mask use, physical distancing, testing in isolation, quarantine, uh, contact tracing, all of this to help uh, mitigate transmission. That was obviously a very different time from today. Today, the vaccine is the ultimate pharmaceutical intervention. And you know, I think the figure on the right demonstrates the concepts, concept of flattening the curve uh, quite clearly. Unvaccinated people have 20 times the risk of dying of COVID as compared to vaccinated people. It's just really unfortunate that nine months after all adults 
became eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, you know, we still have people, many people in our society for all their varied reasons, uh, still not uh, vaccinated. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, this leads me into this list of uh, some of what I think we learned about our society over the past couple of years. And each of these is what I'm gonna say is just a gross understatement, frankly. Uh, so one, public health messages uh, by leadership really does have long lasting impact on people's attitudes. Misinformation uh, is a public health crisis. Uh, unfortunately, misinformation and disinformation is just very taxing for everyone, even for the people who are misinformed. We all you know, want certainty, and people who deliberately spread misinformation are really doing a disservice to society, especially if they have a large following. Some people may feel that you know, they're having a healthy debate, but frankly, debate on topics for which the opinion precedes you know, evidence or data, or the conversation begins with the conclusion and the data follows, you know, I don't really see that as a debate. I see that as uh, you know, the ingredients for an argument. Um, also, we know that the pandemic exposed tremendous inequalities in our society. And we know that the resilience of workers uh, in the public health and healthcare sectors really is not limitless. And of course, the mental health of adults and children have uh, been deeply uh, impacted. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a list of uh, things that I think we've learned about the virus. Uh, one, we knew early on that there was a substantial amount of transmission caused by people who are asymptomatic uh, despite having infection uh, and are, you know, really are a reason why it makes containing SARS-CoV-2 virtually impossible. Uh, the virus continues to evolve and variants each variant has had a selective advantage over previous ones that caused them to spread more rapidly. Uh, you know, we also learned that humans are not the only hosts. Uh, the most recent uh, sort of one that gained a lot of attention was were white-tailed white -tailed deer, uh, you know, in Iowa sampled uh, as having 80% infection with SARS-CoV-2. I'm not aware of any documented cases of uh, deer to, to human transmission of the virus, but we can imagine the threat of uh, a virus that may evolve in the deer population, enter back into humans and look very different, maybe even be novel from an immunological perspective. You know, for that reason and for all other, a lot of other reasons, herd immunity really is unrealistic and uh, it's something we really just shouldn't be considering as part of our future. And so endemicity is the new goal, uh, but you know, what does that even sort of mean? To someone unvaccinated, it means something different. Uh, to people who are up to date on their vaccines, uh, similarly, endemicity may be defined differently. Uh, and to people with weakened immune systems, certainly, uh, you know, we'll think of endemicity quite, quite different from the others. Uh, next slide. So, you know, many in our society have already moved on. I think we know that. California, uh, you know, which has always been ahead uh, of the US overall, in instituting pandemic control measures is now developing their endemic plan. Uh, some of you may have seen these data on this slide. Uh, you know, first, I think it's undeniable that political party of affiliation uh, is correlated with vaccination status. And in this question that was asked of uh, US adults, uh, you know, whether people were worried uh, that they would become seriously sick from the coronavirus. Uh, you can, and also these data come from the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation Vaccine Monitor Report uh, just last month. Uh, and so you can see from the, the, on the right, this was written about by uh, uh, David Leonhardt of uh, the New York Times, who described a concept of uh, irrational skepticism. So you can see that relatively few Republicans, regardless of age, are worried that they might become seriously sick from the coronavirus. And more than half of younger Republicans are not at all worried, so about 52%. Among Democrats, we see a different picture. Uh, age has a very different effect. Younger Democrats are actually more worried than older Democrats, something that you really would not expect uh, given the association of older age and severe COVID. But perhaps that's explained by the fact that younger Democrats lean more liberal than over older Democrats. And uh, David Leonhardt, uh, uh, describes 
uh, this sort of unexpected effect as an example of irrational sort of behavior or irrational uh, skepticism. Now on the right, you see that more than 50% of unvaccinated people are not too worried or not at all worried about getting sick from COVID within the next year. Also feel somewhat irrational since they have no protection potentially uh, against infection. And then well over two thirds of people who are vaccinated and boosted, uh, people with the lowest overall risk of hospitalization and death are worried about getting sick with COVID in the next year. Again, an example perhaps of irrational skepticism among the people who are the least and most, you know, least uh, least uh, at risk and most protected against uh, getting sick from COVID-19. You know, again, so some people have moved on and some may never move on. Uh, next slide. So given this, what might endemicity look like? Um, you know, here's a, a list of things that you know, I think that we would like to see. We'd like to be able to manage absenteeism in, in our workforces a little bit better and in our schools. Uh, we would like to have healthy and stable workforces. We want healthcare systems to be able to serve all patients uh, of all needs. Um, we want more confidence in the local, national, and global economy. Uh, we are you know, no longer talking about COVID-19. And this one's actually inspired by a conversation I had with my mom last night who, who said the pandemic will be over when we stop talking about it. <laughs> um, and finally, I think overall the threat of COVID-19 has to be deemed acceptable. And, and I guess the question is, you know, who's going to declare uh, it acceptable? Uh, next slide. So Nasia brought up flu and, and you know, I think it's a good example uh, to look at, you know, what endemicity might look at. Some might argue it's not the best example, but I think it's worth exploring. Uh, before COVID-19, you know, we had established expected levels of deaths due to pneumonia and influenza. Uh, and that's shown by that sort of wavy line on the bottom of the slide. Uh, and right above that is the epidemic threshold for when we uh, declare an epidemic or epidemic levels of influenza and pneumonia uh, in the population. Now, flu is seasonal, but you know, the future of COVID doesn't have to be. And we can recall the years when flu was severe uh, and we had an, exceeded, an exceeding number of uh, deaths uh, due to flu in 2018. That was a particularly bad year. But since um, that, those increases in deaths due to flu wasn't something that was enduring, I think we all accepted that. And we just accept in general that some flu seasons are worse than others. Uh, and so the threat doesn't necessarily endure. Um, for COVID-19, you can see on the right side of this figure, we clearly have had an enduring uh, threat of mortality uh, due to uh, COVID-19. And at times during the pandemic, one third of all deaths in the United States in a given week in the US were caused by COVID-19. That, that certainly, I think we can all agree that that is certainly a long shot from being acceptable. Uh, next slide. So here we can take a look at excess deaths, uh, which we again, uh, clearly have had many since the start of the pandemic. And these data are for all cause uh, mortality. So excess deaths during the pandemic includes uh, things like opioid overdoses, uh, fatal overdoses, uh, which you know has recently accelerated upward. Certainly it predates COVID, uh, but COVID has exacerbated that crisis. Uh, and so finally, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so I would say that if endemicity is possible, uh, if it were possible, then you know, we should definitely continue uh, to increase immunity in the population, ideally through vaccination, uh, shorten the course of illness and the period of infectiousness uh, with vaccination, of course, and uh, at-home treatments that are newly becoming available and uh, being scaled up. Uh, continue those non-pharmaceutical non interventions, especially when they're warranted and stay ahead, or maybe just frankly keep up with new variants and understanding their threat as early as possible. And of course, we want to address significant gaps in global vaccination. As long as we have inadequate vaccination someplace in the world, we're gonna have a threat of new variants. And there are some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have less than 10% of the population uh, fully vaccinated. Other countries in the world have 90% fully 
vaccinated. I think that disparity is something that we need to address uh, in earnest in order to move to a state of endemicity, not just as a nation, but you know, pushing the world towards feeling more secure. So with that, thank you. Terrific. Uh, there were some great slides there, some of which I want to come back to. Um, but you both talked a little bit about, you know, alluded to this uh, notion that I had in our little teaser to get people to come on and watch. When does the pandemic become an endemic? And, um, you know, uh, I'm from a different discipline, but there is a body of people who are charged with determining when the United States economy is in a recession and when it's out of a recession, you know, and there's criteria they look at and it's, it's kind of well known. There's a little bit of judgment maybe. Um, but I'm just curious, uh, what would you say the definition criteria are for endemic versus pandemic? Is it really uh, a, a mortality rate, uh, a death rate, as you kind of alluded to on that slide, Ajay? Uh, is it a little bit more um, broader than that? And then who, who makes that determination? I'm just curious. Um, and then what are the practical implications for behavior uh, if we were to say, well, you know, it's it's now just around and, uh, you know, I guess Denmark today uh, was was their first day of saying, you know, we're back to normal uh, soldier on people. I, I don't know. Maybe they didn't say it exactly that way, but. Yeah, uh, you know, it's possible that being endemic is a state of mind and not a state in the in society. Uh, people will not agree as to whether, you know, the, the pandemic is over. Um, I definitely am not implying that mortality should be uh, the basis of determining whether something is endemic. But I think those figures illustrate the threat that we've been under for uh, two years now and everything, all the ripple effects of the worry that anxiety that people feel. That being said, from the very beginning of the pandemic, some thought it was over the day it started and have functioned that way since. Um, what is the definition of endemicity? You know, I'm not sure. It's one of those things I think we will perhaps collectively feel when we get there. Uh, but I do think there'll be some people in our society that will never feel that the threat is over, it's especially people with weakened immune systems uh, or just in, in general people who are concerned about the rise in deaths due to COVID. Well, I hope viewers will go back to that, what I would consider a real money slide you had, trends before COVID-19, where we show flu deaths in what we thought was a bad year, 2018, compared to what we've seen with COVID. Uh, because there are people who still kind of feel like, well, there's just this confounding now. A lot of this is flu deaths. Well, it's not even close. and. Um, you know, the data on excess deaths, which I follow pretty carefully, because that to me is pretty unassailable as a measure of what the impact of the pandemic is, because, you know, what else has had that big of an impact? It, it may include some of the knock on effects of a stressed health system, right? But it's been a huge impact on us all. So Dr. Safdar, do you have any thoughts about pandemic versus endemic? And when will we feel comfortable declaring, as Denmark did, we're back to normal? Yeah, no, I don't know that I have too much to add to what you and Ajay said. You know, we look to the WHO as the sort of body, since you mentioned uh, a group that might declare it. But in the absence of WHO saying much, I think countries have just decided to take in upon themselves to declare that for them, the pandemic has ended. But as Ajay said, you know, this is a global situation. So you might say that something has ended in your place, but it could just be a matter of time before something new comes up because you haven't addressed the other uh, drivers of that spread. Ajay, you also had a, an interesting slide about, um, you know, people who are vaccinated and boosted are still more worried. And of course, maybe it's the causality doesn't run from being vaccinated to boosted in terms of how I feel, but it's how I feel determines whether I get vaccinated and boosted. And if I'm a worrier, I did that, but I'm still worried. And uh, 
Any thoughts on that? I mean, people who remain on top of mitigation and remain on top of vaccination and boosting do it because they aren't worried about COVID. So they see the vaccine as important to them, but it doesn't necessarily reduce the worry if outside your home, there are raging rates of COVID. Uh, and, you know, it takes data to prove that you're adequately protected. And when we hear our friends and family getting breakthrough infections, it can make us feel worried. I, I'm not surprised by that, uh, you know, but I think it's, the, the data are clear. When you're vaccinated and boosted, you really have a very low rate of severe COVID. Dr. Safdar, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about long COVID, and maybe I missed this in your presentation, but is long COVID more prevalent in unvaccinated patients than vaccinated, conditional on having been exposed to the virus in the first place? Do we know anything about that? I think what we're going to find that it likely is. I mean, at this point, it's still somewhat anecdotal, but there does seem to be emerging data that vaccination protects you against long COVID, even if you get breakthrough infection after that. So it's not just the you know fully upstream effect of preventing COVID altogether. So I think we will probably find that to be the case, but I don't know that that is quite out there yet. James Rotenberg uh, has, has posed the question, uh, what do we know about the B2 Omicron variant, also known as Steph Omicron, Stealth Omicron, sorry. Um, Dr. Safdar, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, there's been some emerging news about it being potentially more contagious than the current circulating Omicron, but that's as far as I think we know. There really is no data out there on the effect of boosters or, or vaccines. I mean, I have to say, given everything that we've seen so far, I would be surprised if, it, if vaccines and boosters weren't effective against it too. Uh, but the country that has probably had the most experience with it is now South Africa because they were done with their Omicron and now are having to deal with it. But a lot more to come probably, but at this point, no hard data really. Uh, Pam Evans wonders, have there been any studies on long COVID in children and adolescents? Very little has been looked at for long COVID in children. I would say the group that people are focusing on is young adults. Because, you know, as very productive members of society for the future, say 50 years uh, for people that are in their 20s or in their teens. So that group is the focus of intense attention because you go from being, you know, a very able bodied individual to what could be a seemingly mild COVID illness and to find yourselves in the throes of long COVID is, is of course, very worrisome for, for society at large and the individual that is experiencing it. Um, so um, to answer the next question on there is it doesn't seem to be necessarily related to the severity of the initial COVID infection, the long COVID piece of it. But of course, people with very little cardiopulmonary reserve and those in the ICU will be confounded by the persistence of fatigue and deconditioning and all the things that come with a hospital stay. I mean, people have likened ICU stays to being in, you know, to, similar to being in a car accident. It takes a, a good long while to recover from it, even mm -hmm. if you survive well. If a person's been, you know, fully vaccinated, boosted, and then also had COVID, you know, maybe because they had to go to the Las Vegas Bowl as a condition of employment or something like that, should they feel more confident today about just going out and doing their thing? Well, I mean, they've, they've done everything that they could um, in terms of, you know, protecting themselves. And of course, the breakthrough infection will have also resulted in some immunity. Uh, so I think in the short term, yes, uh, there is a, a real threat of reinfection with COVID, which is why we don't recommend that people who just have immunity from natural disease, they should also get vaccinated. We recommend that. Uh, but yeah, I think protection is higher when all three are in play. Question, um, two years in, is the willingness to mitigate masks, distancing, et cetera, you know, staying home, uh, has it reached its peak? Uh, you know, how, how much uh, harder can we push on those kind of mitigation measures, especially when we see other countries saying, eh, it's over. And, you know, are there are there really big differences in the experience of states based on how they've treated the virus, um, you know, with public policy? Any comment on that? I'll say that, one, to many, the messaging may seem you know, uh, overly repeated 
But on the other hand, you know, I, I think of it like the jingle of a commercial. Uh, you get tired of hearing it, but you know, it sticks with you. Uh, and eventually it becomes just intrinsic knowledge uh, that wearing a mask, keeping distance, you know, those are important things. Public must be doing some of this since we've seen lower rates of flu uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think as, as tiring as that might be, I think at times when those uh, mitigation strategies are important and necessary, people will appreciate that they didn't forget their mask at home. Does anyone else get whiplash when you, you know, move through parts of the state of Wisconsin where nobody wears a mask and then uh, you come back and everybody's wearing a mask and, you know, uh, do we, do we see that on a per capita basis outcomes are that much worse in places where, you know, those types of mitigation measures are more lax? Yeah. I mean, there have been some analyses looking at policies at a county level. I think the state was uh, Iowa uh, where they showed that uh, counties that instituted a mask mandate had lower rates of COVID and neighboring uh, counties that did not have such a mandate had higher uh, rates of COVID. And there's lots of examples that, you know, mandates can work, uh, but of course, mandates are only as successful as they're followed. And yeah, over time, there can certainly be an erosion or of enthusiasm for wearing a mask, just to put it nicely. There is going to be a mountain of data for epidemiology students for years to come, I think. Wow. Um, there's a lot we, we can still learn from this because, you know, it's not over. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty challenging to find the natural experiments in the data because, of course, we're not experimenting county by county. It's people are, are making choices. A uh, question from Jim Ross. What is the status of people getting a second booster? Where are we at with that? recommendation and uh, take up rate? So I think with the first booster, you know, the, the uptake could be better, no doubt. But I think the groups that are most likely to be at risk for breakthrough, which is the immunocompromised population, I think for that population, the rates are pretty good. I think that, you know, Israel, for instance, is toying with the idea of a second booster or a fourth dose for people who are not immunocompromised, but just fall in high risk groups, such as, you know, age based cutoffs, for instance. And I don't think we know whether that's going to be necessary or not. I mean, the data for the one booster against Omicron is pretty compelling, as is the data with the fact that the just the two doses enough is not sufficient. It would have been if it weren't for Omicron, but with Omicron, you need to have the booster. And sometimes that's a hard message for patients to and people to understand is because, you know, the definition, the technical definition of complete vaccination is still the two dose for the two dose series. And people will say, well, I'm fully vaccinated, which is true. But for Omicron, it's the booster that really is going to give you the protection you need. Have we hit the wall kind of on vaccination in the U.S. in terms of people who are willing to do it? Uh, in other words, there may be more shots in arms going forward, but it'll be, you know, boosters or a second booster. Uh, has the, the number of people who are fully vaccinated continued to move or has it really just topped out, do you think? It continues to move upward. Uh, in Wisconsin, you know, on a weekly basis, we administer 30, 40,000 uh, doses. Some of them, a lot of them might be boosters, but new people are getting vaccinated. The, the ticker does climb. It may feel slower, but I don't think it's a wall. I think it's, I think when we started uh, vaccination, I'm not sure anybody should have expected three months and everybody is fully vaccinated. I actually think that the trend has been pretty much consistent with how we might see perceived risk out there. It's consistent with uptake of vac other vaccines, uh, and actually it's higher than like influenza vaccine uptake uh, because the threat of COVID is greater. So I don't think we've hit a wall. It, it may feel slow and you know, 80% of kids, 80% uh, of people five years and older have had at least one shot in the United States. The norm is to actually give it a chance. Eight out of 10, five plus is, is pretty high. Um, I would say the unvaccinated individuals are outnumbered now. Mm. 
question from Brett Hawkins. Any hypotheses out there as to what is causing the brain fog so many are experiencing? I guess, is brain fog a separate phenomenon from long COVID, Dr. Softar? It seems to be part of how patients describe their experience with long COVID. It's a bit hard to be more specific than that. You know, sometimes some of our patients have said, you know, I don't really have the words to describe what I'm feeling, except that I think like I'm walking in a fog all day. And so that does make us think about long COVID when someone brings that up. There are a number of hypotheses, none of which have really been tested rigorously, but some of the prevailing theories are that could it have something to do with the gut brain axis? You know, your gut microbiome is a key part of your immune system. And when that immune system is um, disrupted, as we know with SARS-CoV-2 taking up a place in the gut, you know, it may not necessarily cause severe GI symptoms in everyone, but it's definitely present in high quantities in the intestine. And so could that be playing a role? The other thing that people have likened this to is the chronic fatigue syndrome, which is now called uh, post-exertional malaise related um, effects. So I think there may be some lessons that we could learn there, but um, that's about as far as we've gotten with it. Speaking of the gut, can COVID cause uh, weight gain? No, don't, don't take that question. Uh, question from Jim Krause. Um, Jim wonders if a person is vaccinated and boosted, how long is the vaccination expected to last? What's the latest on that? Um, I can start with that. So much longer than one would think. You know, there's the two aspects of the vaccine protection. One is the B cells and the other is the T cells. So the antibodies, which are the B cells, is what we can detect more easily with the blood test. And so most of the studies that you'll see that talk about a decay over time will be talking about the antibodies. But there's the whole other arm of the immune system, which is the T cell arm, which um, you know may stay quiescent for a while, but really revs up when you're exposed to COVID in a big way. And so I think that when we feel that vaccine protection decays, it's true, it does, but not nearly to the extent that um, one would be worried about. Question from Nancy Shanky. Do you have thoughts about the seasonality of COVID-19 infection? Yeah, I'll say that up till now, it hasn't been seasonal. Um, peaks have come at times we didn't necessarily expect them to occur, but the winters have always been bad as our activities have moved uh, indoors. In the future, we'll just have to see. I think when there's a new variant and people are milling about in society as if there isn't a pandemic, it will spread if, if people have susceptibility to that new variant, and that can happen any month. And isn't it the case that as long as we have regions of the world where vaccinations aren't very prevalent and we can have outbreaks and the rest of the world that's more vaccinated is traveling in and out, we will just continue to bring new variants back uh, to the U.S. or you know any other country and uh, we'll continue to be kind of on the run fighting this thing. Yeah, travel is always the way viruses spread from one place to another. Local travel and, and cross-national travel. Are we doing enough to get shots in people in developed countries? And what, you know, what are the ethical considerations about that? What, yeah, what it's definitely, on that? I would say, it, I, I would say it's amoral uh, to, for countries to have less than 10% of a population uh, fully vaccinated. It, it just doesn't seem right. You know, in infectious diseases, there's this whole class of neglected infectious diseases around the world. They're neglected because people with wealth and countries with wealth don't deem them necessarily uh, addressable or interested in addressing it. But locally, they cause a significant amount of morbidity and mortality. And it'd be a shame if COVID-19 becomes neglected in some parts of the world simply because those countries with supplies and the wealth to vaccinate uh, lower income countries don't try. Dr. Softar, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel completely the same way. I think sometimes you forget this is a global issue. You know, that's why it's a pandemic. And so you can do whatever you want to do locally, which is important, of course, but unless you tackle it globally, we're always going to find ourselves uh, be on the back foot. Uh, 
Mike Shannon wonders, when are vaccines for children under five going to be approved and how long will it take for them to be widely available in your opinion? It sounded like very soon, at least the request has been put in. And so if the other approvals are any indication, it should be imminent very quickly. I think the supply issue no longer seems to be a major uh, aspect of it, but of course it'll take a little bit of time for pharmacies and other places to, to ramp up. I mean, children under five are a, are a special group, so a lot more care needs to be taken. And then a question from William Schmitz about breakthrough infections. Do we know, are, are there special factors that we understand make people more vulnerable to a breakthrough infection? You know, I think it's it's very interesting because people have attempted to look at that. And one big factor seems to be, you know, the duration from the last, this is before the booster. So the duration from the last vaccine shot, because the longer that you were out from it, the, if you were exposed to COVID, you were likely to get a breakthrough infection. Short of that, I think it, it's really determined by your, um, by your exposure risk. You know, if you're engaging in behaviors or activities that will put you in proximity to somebody who may be incubating it or maybe symptomatic, that seems to be the biggest factor. Um, Ajay, do you have other thoughts on this? Um, the only thing I'll add is that uh, it's complicated by the fact that some people uh, who have breakthrough aren't even aware of it, that they're yeah. asymptomatic and they stay asymptomatic and may never have tested. So the data are just very inadequate uh, to really understand that. Well, um, last question about testing, uh, and in particular, the, the rapid tests often we, we see aren't picking up Omicron for up to three to four days after a PCR test might pick it up. And, um, you know, how does that make you feel about the effectiveness of the rapid tests and how we might be utilizing them in preventing the spread of COVID? You know, I think they do have a key role to play as long as one understands the limitations. You know, the attraction of these antigen tests is that they are very convenient. They can be done in the comfort of your home. They are relatively cheap uh, and you can do them serially if you've been exposed and don't know exactly when you might become, you know, a threat to others if you're incubating something and are, and are asymptomatic. But there are limitations like any test and the limitation is that it just doesn't have the performance characteristics of the PCR. So it's not going to be as sensitive as a PCR, but in someone with symptoms, a positive antigen test, I think gives you the answer that that's what you're contending with. And it might save you a trip to the ER or a trip to wherever you would have to go for a PCR, you know, not expose other people en route. So I, I feel like they do have a key role to play here. I'll, I'll also just throw in for that context described, um, using a rapid test three to four days after a PCR test, it's a little unclear when exposure may have happened. Um, and with so much Omicron out there, exposure could be almost daily sometimes uh, yeah. for some people. So if, if somebody is PCR positive, they could be at the tail end of an asymptomatic infection. And at that point, it's not going to be picked up by a rapid test. So it's complicated. Uh, I think, I think as Nasia said, when you have symptoms, that should be your clue uh, that you should get tested. And a rapid test probably will turn up positive if you have COVID. Well... Um, we are at the top of the hour, and um, I know how hard both of you are uh, working these days and how much uh, demand there is for your time, and I want to be respectful, but I can assure you uh, when we create the UW Now Hall of Fame, you will be inducted in the first class. You have been uh, just terrific participants, and we really appreciate you sharing your time with our audience again tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks to all of our audience members for joining us this evening. Uh, we will be back at least uh, on Saturday, March 12th, possibly once before then. But on March 12th, we're going to have a special live edition from Scottsdale, Arizona. And I hope you'll join me for a conversation on baseball, money ball, and big data with Bud Selig, uh, former owner of the Milwaukee Brewers and former commissioner of Major League Baseball, Lewis Wolf, former owner of the Oakland A's, and UW's own Laura Albert, author of the blog Badger Bracketology. That promises to be a great show. You won't want to miss it. And uh, it'll be a great fusion of baseball history and all the way up to uh, modern use of artificial intelligence.
and machine learning uh, to do things like predict basketball, but also how it's changing the economy in the world. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Look forward to seeing you again in the near future and on Wisconsin. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger.